This program contains a graphic image of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Viewer discretion is advised. On November 22, 1963, all of Dallas, Texas was abuzz over the visit of President John F. Kennedy and his wife Jackie. Throngs of people crowded along the roads as his motorcade snaked its way through the city. A Dallas dress manufacturer named Abraham Zapruder stood in a small crowd with his home movie camera waiting for the President of the United States to pass by. As Kennedy's motorcade turned the corner into Dealey Plaza, Zapruder put his eye to the viewfinder and began filming. This unassuming man, using an ordinary camera, captured a seminal moment in the history of America. Indeed, in the entire history of the 20th century. In March of 1997, at the National Archives II in College Park, Maryland, a replication of this moment in history began. For five days, photographers painstakingly reshot the film frame by frame from Zapruder's camera original to 4x5 transparencies. This reproduction is the first time a copy of the film has been made from the original since the day of Kennedy's assassination. Zapruder owned a Bell & Howell model 414 PD home movie camera that was considered double eight millimeter format. Zapruder accompanied a group of workers from the dress factory to Dealey Plaza to watch as the Kennedys passed. Marilyn Sitzman, one of his assistants, recalls what happened. And we're talking about, well, where can he stand? Because by this time, there's quite a few people gathering. And we'd go look at this place, and we'd go look at that place. And we know where that concrete pair plot was, and we decided that would be the best place. Because we said, you can get up here, you'll be above everybody. No matter how many people were down here, you don't, don't have anybody blocking the view. Zapruder never took his eye from the viewfinder as he shot the film. As the horrifying news of the shooting traveled through the streets, a stunned Zapruder began walking to his office. As he was leaving Dealey Plaza, he ran into Harry McCormick, a reporter for the Dallas Morning News, and told him about the film. McCormick arranged to meet back in Zapruder's office, but first, he wanted to find Forrest Sorrells, an agent he knew from the Dallas Secret Service field office, to inform him of the film. When McCormick arrived at Zapruder's office with Secret Service agent Sorrells, the men accompanied Zapruder and his partner to have the film processed. McCormick believed the film could be developed at the Dallas Morning News, so the men went there. Finding no motion picture processing at the newspaper, they walked next door to the paper's television station, WFAA. Hearing of the eyewitness in their studios, Producers at the station put Zapruder on the air and interviewed him on live TV. A gentleman just walked in our studio that I am meeting for the first time as well as you. This is WFA TV in Dallas, Texas. May I have your name, please, sir? My name is Abraham Zapruder. Mr. Zapruder? Zapruder, yes, sir. Zapruder. And would you tell us your story, please, sir? I get out in, uh, about a half hour earlier and get to a good spot to shoot some pictures. And I found a spot, one of these uh, concrete blocks that I have down near that park near the underpass. And I got on top there, there was another girl from my office, she was right behind me. And as I was shooting, as the president was coming down from Houston Street making his turn, it was about halfway down there, I had a shot. And he slumped to the side, like this. Then I had another shot or two, I couldn't say what it was one or two. And I saw his head practically opened up, all blood and everything, and I kept on shooting. That's about all. I'm just sick again. I think that pretty well expresses the entire yeah. feelings of the whole world. Yeah. You have the film in your camera. We'll try yes, to... I brought it on the studio. Now. We'll try to get that processed and have it as soon as possible. In the meantime, McCormick discovered that only Kodak could develop the film. He made arrangements with their processing plant in Dallas to do it. When the men arrived at Kodak, Sorrells received a phone call and was ordered to return to downtown Dallas. A suspect in the assassination named Lee Harvey Oswald had been detained. While there are conflicting stories about what day the film was shown, 
It is certain that the Zapruder film was first screened in the projection room at the Kodak plant. Phil Chamberlain, who was production supervisor, recalls the first showing. So when that film came off the processing machine, Mr. Zapruder was there, and he and I and quite a group of our people, probably about 15 in all, went into the projection room to see what he had on his film. Uh, and he started out, uh, as we were threading it up, apologizing that he really didn't know what was on the rest of the film, uh, that he re wasn't much of a photographer. The well, film was only, I believe, 22 seconds long. And, and that last shot, you see his head come off. And I mean, you could see it so clear. I, 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 I've seen all these replicas and all the copies, nothing like that first one. Upon seeing the film, the Secret Service immediately asked for copies. The Kodak man said, you'll have to take it to Jameson. I'd never even heard of Jameson. He told us where it was. I, I think he called it, but I'm not sure. Even under these high pressure circumstances, mere hours after he witnessed the president's murder and with the Secret Service tracking his every move, Zapruder had the wherewithal to obtain affidavits from Kodak and the Jameson Laboratory stating the specific work they did. The first affidavit signed by Phil Chamberlain shows the work for the processing of the original film. And Zapruder and the Jameson people signed the agreements that there wouldn't be more than three copies made. And uh, they made the three copies. And we had to take those copies to Kodak to get them developed. After the duplicates were processed at Kodak, Zapruder and Schwartz drove to a downtown police station. On Friday evening, November 22nd, Zapruder gave two of the three copies of his film to the Secret Service. By that time, Air Force One containing the body of the slain president and the newly sworn in president, Lyndon B. Johnson, had already landed in Washington, D.C. Once the news community heard of the Zapruder film, they clamored for the rights to it. Life magazine was especially fervent in its desire to get the film. Richard Stolley, the Pacific Coast editor for Life, flew into Dallas the afternoon of the assassination. In an interview before a live audience, Stolley recalls his weekend in Dallas. So we sat down, and I said to her, <coughs> I said, Mrs. Spruder, um, when Life uh, occasionally encounters pictures of uh, more than normal interest that we um, will pay more than our normal space rates. I'm trying to be as casual as hell about all this. And, and I said, now, for instance, that piece of film we just saw, I said, you know, we might pay as much as $5,000 for that. <laughs> and he gives, he gives me this kind of quizzical look and then grins. The whole point of that was to find out, did he know? And yes, he knew. So we just went up by increments, little by little. I got to $50,000, and I said, Mrs. Spruder, this is truly as high as I can go without calling New York for, uh, for authorization to go higher. And he looked at me for a few minutes, and there was a few seconds, and said, let's do it. By Saturday evening, the 23rd of November, Zapruder's film was at Life's Printing Plant in Chicago. While the original film was in Chicago, a copy was sent to New York. Sometime on Sunday, the publisher of Life magazine, C.D. Jackson, saw the 26-second film. Jackson decided the American public was not ready for such graphic images of the president's death and instructed Stolley to buy the motion picture rights to the film as well. I called him on Sunday evening and I said I'd like to come back and see him about um, getting the additional rights. Uh, I have to say he seemed relieved. On Monday morning, Stolly met with Zapruder and his attorney, Sam Passman. We sat there, it couldn't have taken more than um, 15 minutes. I knew, again, where I could go. Uh, it was another 100,000. It was a total of $150,000 for all rights. By the time of JFK's funeral on Monday, November 24th, Time Incorporated owned all rights to the Zapruder film. A week after the shooting in Dallas, President Johnson created a special commission to investigate Kennedy's assassination. 
Known as the Warren Commission, after Commission Chairman Chief Justice Earl Warren, the group of former and then government officials were to oversee the investigation and give their stamp of approval to the conclusions. During the investigation, the Zapruder film was examined closely by the Commission staff, but the print they used was a second-generation copy made by the FBI from one of the Secret Service copies. Some of the investigators wanted to look at a better copy and requested that the original film be borrowed from Time Incorporated. A representative from Life's Photographic Lab brought the film to Washington and projected it a few times for the investigators. 35 millimeter slides were made of some of the frames. When the commission published its findings, one volume contained black and white stills made from the Zapruder slides provided by Life. Researchers looking at these reproductions noticed that some of the frames were missing and that splices were clearly evident. Critics of the Warren Commission suspected a cover-up, claiming the missing frames revealed something conspiratorial. In 1967, Life magazine offered an explanation. Photolab technicians damaged the film when making copies and reproducing still frames. Specifics on how or when the accidents occurred were never given. In 1969, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison indicted a local businessman, Clay Shaw, for conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. During the trial, Garrison subpoenaed the Zapruder film from Time Incorporated, using the conclusions drawn from the film as evidence of conspiracy. Abraham Zapruder was called as a prosecution witness to verify that the film Garrison received from life was indeed the film Zapruder took the day of the assassination. On February 13, 1969, in a packed courtroom, Zapruder's film was shown in public for the first time. By the end of the trial, it had been shown nine more times. With the film in his possession, Garrison made sure duplicates were made. A conspiracy believer, Garrison wanted the bootleg copies to be distributed to colleges and universities across the country. After seeing the film, he believed the students would demand the assassination investigation be reopened. One of these bootleg copies was the centerpiece of a presentation called Who Killed JFK that traveled across the country in the mid-70s. Zapruder never saw the widespread public reaction to his film. He died in Dallas on August 30th, 1970, of cancer. On March 6, 1975, the Zapruder film was broadcast for the first time on television on an ABC talk show called Good Night America, hosted by Geraldo Rivera. The guests that evening were comedian and human rights activist Dick Gregory and photography expert Robert Groden. Now, before he goes behind the sign, the president is waving to the crowd. When he comes out from behind the sign, he is shot, and then Governor Connolly is shot. He's already been hit. He's already been hit. And now, at the bottom of the screen, the headshot. That's the shot that blew off his head. It's the most horrifying thing I've ever seen in the movies. Now, the Warren Commission said that all of the shots were fired from behind by Lee Harvey Oswald, a lone assassin, firing at the president. And as you can see, clearly, the head is thrown violently backwards, con completely consistent with the shot from the front right. Now, this is an extreme blow-up of just the president from the film. All right. Coming out behind the sign, he's shot. He's hit from the sit here. From the front, too. From, from the front. front. Now, Jackie doesn't realize what's happened yet. She goes to his aid. And now? The Zapruder film, at the time of this unauthorized screening, was still owned by Time Incorporated. The film broadcast that evening belonged to Groden, who claimed it was made from the original film, but gave vague explanations on how he obtained the copy.